Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the What the Finance podcast, where we talk to experts to help gain a greater understanding about what is happening in the world of finance, investing, and markets. And on today's podcast, I'm happy to welcome Hugh Hendry, who's founder at Eclectica Asset Management, an award-winning hedge fund manager and host of the Asset Capitalist podcast. So, Hugh, thanks for joining the podcast today. Guys, I'd never be persuaded by, like, dilute like an expert. Okay. Uh, expert, I went... I created a, a life. My parents created a life. Um, I've spent it um, thumbing, um, thumbing my nose at, at damn experts. When, when uh, the award-winning, <laughs> I think it was award-winning for entertainment, um, the award-winning uh, macro hedge fund Eclectica ceased existence in, at the end of 2017. Uh, but I survived. I, I, I generated tenure of 15 years, which... Um, most hedge funds, they don't tell you this, but most of them fail. It's like opening a restaurant. So I succeeded for 15 years. And the distinction for me was, again, um, I was the, the architect of, of, of my, my rare successes and the, the multitude of errors. You know, this is a, a game where success is defined by being like, I don't know, is it 52.7% right and, and, and the, the remainder being wrong? And my claim to distinction was I didn't want the edge. I didn't want the call from the bank with the flow with, hey, our, ex- our expert is saying this, we want you to be the first one to know. Um, the only edge that I was looking to meet is the guitarist from U2. Um, and, and so I gave short uh, thrift to that kind of engagement with um, investment banks. Yeah, well, I looked at your uh, the summary on your podcast, and I'm just going to read it out now. So he said, uh, Robert Mugabe's henchman once threatened to throw him out of a plane at 30,000 feet, uh, and the good people of Iceland sent him death threats when he foretold them of their future bankruptcy. The SEAL who assassinated Osama bin Laden taught him to shoot, and is dined with the CIA in a North Korean embassy in the northern states of China. So I guess, does that sort of represent who you are, or, or who is Hugh Hendry? <laughs> that... that- that is the acid capitalist. Uh, that's a life, a life well spent. All of those little snippets happened. They are, they are not an exaggeration. Um, and I've, I've got a book which I've sat on for a year. It's, it's my my story. Um, and you know what? I think I'm just gonna I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna. I'm going to publish, self-publish it. I think I might put it on Substack or whatever. So um, if you're intrigued, people, um, you know. Follow me on 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 Twitter at um, at Hendry underscore Hugh, and you'll find out more. Yeah, because I think when people think, I guess, of hedge fund manager, I guess you probably wouldn't be the quintessential person they would think of. Um, what why is that? Do you think? Do you think there's just been a people focusing too much on the same thing, not looking at the contrarian view because of the what's been happening over the past 14, 15 years, where basically stocks have gone up? Or what's your opinion on that? Um, so um, hedge funds really exploded, took off in the uh, aftermath of the, the great destruction um, of people's wealth during the, the tech bubble and burst um, at the turn of this century. You know, the markets turned in, in March of that year. And, and over the, the ensuing two years, you saw an 80% drawdown in the NASDAQ, which was mirrored in some of the rooty tooty stock markets like Germany, like et al. Um, in general, stocks fell about between 50 and 60%. And if you were invested in a mutual fund, uh, a unit trust to use its lexicon in the UK, uh, you were paying um, additional fees for active management. <laughs> and, uh, and when the market went down, you know, the, there was no active management. I mean, the active management was deplorable. They, you know, you just lost money. So uh, hedge funds came in saying, you know, like we'll put a floor, you, you know, you don't have to underwrite that. And so there was a great burst of activity. Now, back then, uh, so, you know, before the advent of unicorns and, and tech platforms or winner takes all, um, the, the highest return on intellectual capital uh, was the hedge fund game. You know, this kind of 2% on the float and then 20% roadkill on, on the profit uh, was a pretty cool deal. And, and therefore, if you think about it rationally, and, and I do have rational moments, you, 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 you 
got to think that the highest returns attract the smartest people. The highest returns on intellect kind of would attract the smartest people on the planet. Um, that kind of makes sense until you actually meet some of these people. But but by and large, it holds, you know, my peer group uh, were super, super smart, intelligent, switched on, aggressive operators. Um, and for me, I rationalized that it doesn't make sense to try and outsmart, out sleuth the smartest dudes in the planet. You know, like that, that's a kind of, that's a road crash, that's a dead end. So instead, I asked myself, why is it that even with super smart brains, even by being the, the smartest person on the planet, you are not guaranteed to succeed in the crazy, crazy messed up world of speculation? Um, and I try to answer that question and work it back. So that's perhaps why I am not your quintessential hedge fund manager, because I set out not to be. And that's why um, you know, people want to define performance in terms of how much money did you make? Make you know, it's like how big is your whatever you know, um, your castle, um, and that's that's not the. I don't think that's the right metric. Um, my thing, the thing that I achieved, is is rare, in that I was, let's use a pretentious term, orth orthogonal, like you you know, like you get the compass points. The, the s and P's here and then like you know bond returns are there and typically there's a scatter point of where you might find hedge funds like for me you needed a third <laughs> third dimension and I was somewhere lost in space which is to say you know I was what everyone desires Bitcoin to be I I did not correlate to anything in the financial universe and and so that that unique property made me interesting to asset allocators because putting me into the mix theoretically should improve the portfolio return for such an investor. Yeah, it's interesting. So how, how like we say that you were contrarian, how does that look? And I know that's a very specific question, but... It's a great question. Yeah. Have you got more to it or... That, that's it if you want to take away you want <laughs> I, I, i'll let you go with the with the flow it's a great short question yeah um the i i, I simply wanted to riff with the notion uh with the paradox which is that for all that people wanted to to pin the label of contrarian on me um i was a trend following contrarian which is like you, you kind of want to dial that back that it's actually everyone else that's contrarian. Um, and my definition of contrarian, I think through the prism from which you ask it and how it's pop, the popular conception of contrarian is kind of like some weird person that, that sees the future and is kind of, and, and is displaced by, by today, will only make sense in the future. And I, for sure, that's me. You know, my, my business each day was waking up and it was a blank canvas, the future. We, ha we haven't been there yet, so it was blank. And my job in my, in my creative workshop was to invent credible but very much contentious narratives which could go on to be accepted, become an accepted belief system that people could invest in. And of course, prices would be of a, a, of a different magnitude and scale at that point. And that would be my, my P&L. But where I wish to challenge the perception of oddity is that all of my ideas were amassed and given credibility, the more that they aligned with prices. You know, if I wanted to be long an asset, I would be long assets which were trending higher. And when I say that actually everyone else is a contrarian because the conception of a contrarian is you're buying something going down in the belief that it's going to change, mm -hmm. right? I, I disavow that. That's not my form of contrarianism. Um, 
what you people get into a huge tesla is a great example uh, the amount of smart people who have shorted which is to say destroyed their clients money with tesla right now you might be right at the end tesla might reset to like below 100 bucks but up until about 18 months ago tesla's had a positive trend so it's not a short position. So if you are shorting a positive trending Tesla, you're a, you're a contrarian. You're a bad contrarian. That, that's, that's the popular perception. So my contrarianism is I would be buying, buying things that would be, be, would be rising in price, but people would be telling me I was wrong. I'm like, well, yeah, we'll see. So you're looking past, I guess, the traditional valuations and all yes. those different aspects and maybe traditional macro thoughts to... Yeah, trend and, and other influence as well in terms of your investing. Yeah, so, and that very much reveals you know, the pop psychology of, of the marketplace. Um, the one of my, you know, I do this a lot, you know, I'm, I'm a talker. Um, and, you know, and one of the, the clips that I'm associated with is the, the great dangers, uh, the, the conceit and the arrogance of a well formed argument. Yeah. And, and I fell prey to that. It, it almost destroyed my fledgling career when I elected in my first kind of promotion within an asset management business. Uh, my, my first big like balls on the line for the firm's capital. Uh, foolishly, I bought a Reader's, Reader's Digest. Uh, I say foolishly because it went bankrupt. Uh, <laughs> Now that was many red uh, red flags. It was an IPO, right? So there was no observable price data. It was like a I I, I book seats in busy restaurants and I walk past them empty restaurants. My great horror is when I find myself dining in and em- I hate dining in empty restaurants. What is the point? Again, and and but but it's a, a measure of there's an intel built into the occupation of the seats. So I didn't have intel. I didn't have that market wisdom in an IPO. So I typically don't do IPOs are a con. I, I, P, let me say it again. IPOs are a con nine times out of 10. Yeah? Um, it's a means of rewarding um, clients who trade. I, the, the clients who enrich the bank get a deal, i.e. they get a big allocation and then the bank pops the price so all the suckers, like your audience, they buy the, they buy the pop um, and the clients then sell into it and everyone's happy, except again, the client, yeah? Um, so I, I didn't have market wisdom. And then following the IPO, uh, Reader's Digest, the share price did not pop. <laughs> it, it imploded, it went down. And I checked my arguments. I thought this was a, a kind of Warren Buffett, deep moated global franchise undervalued. Um, it had a zero cost in terms of like, uh, it was peddling last week's news. Like one, once it's released the day after, it, you know, so they were able to, to buy and condense uh, news information for nothing and then repackage it. So I thought, wonderful. Um, but I was alone, so I was contrarian because the market price kept falling and I kept buying more and more until one of the investment partners tapped me on the shoulder, slapped me in the face and sold the damn thing. Okay, so that's contrarianism. And thankfully I went, I endured that at a young age and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm beyond it now. So that pushed you to continue to be contrarian, but change your strategy in terms of actually having an understanding obviously more data more information about these potential investments that you'd be looking at so i think it led me to so i i eventually i was working in scotland and i eventually after eight years um came to london and through great um uh, twists of fate or fortune i i landed a job with a hedge fund in, um, in london and the manager was using charts and i i, yeah, I was like what were you yeah, you know, like only idiots look at charts. <laughs> you know, I was deep. I, I was the Taliban. You know, they look like they're hiding my hair. I'm the Taliban. You know, like, you know. Uh, the the fundamentals, like you know, the scriptures, the return on equity, the you know, the various metrics. I knew them all. Um, 
but I didn't know how to see the twists and turns of the future. And, and, and I suddenly discovered through curiosity and playfulness that the charts, it's a bit like, a, you know, what does a doctor do on, on the rounds in a hospital? The first thing is he looks at a chart of, of the vitals. Can you, can, you, can you imagine being an investor today and you don't, it's like being a doctor and you don't look at the chart of the vitals. Um, and so I've come around to, so that is not to dismiss uh, well-formed arguments. They are absolutely, you know, deep knowledge is an absolute prerequisite, but it's not enough. It's kind of like, you know, it's the cost of admission into the game. And actually what it is, is um, it's a good inventory retrieval system. It's like, have the idea. The chart will tell you, you know what, let's, let's put it over here. Let's stack it in the shelving just now, but let's not forget it. And then when the, when the chart starts saying, oh, I've got a trend here. Tell me that story again. Plug and play. Uh, that's, that's essentially what I was doing. Yeah. I do struggle with those people who are either like, and I guess we have to learn the whole way, but they're either like all fundamentals, charts are rubbish, or they're the opposite. All, you know, technicals, fundamentals are rubbish. I think, as you said, you have to be open-minded to basically anything, have a listen. And from there, you can decide, is this useful or is this not, I think. Well, your mind has to be open. Has to, I mean, this is the most impossible gig in the in the planet. You know, um, you you have to be creative and open to all ideas. And and another thing is, um, I could, you know, I, I speak with the passion of a member of the the, the you know, I, I'm a preacher preacher man. Um, you must you must do this or whatever. You know, um, the following day, I could sell it. You know, I, I emotional intelligence. Boom, gone. You know, the uh, I made fifty percent in the calendar. My first calendar year, I made fifty five zero percent gains on the net asset value. Uh, one one of the, the, the perhaps the only reason why you know not the only reason, but um, you know the, the first year is so important. You know, it, it meant that I had a future because I really nailed a big number in the first year, um, and that came from gold. But um, I remember having amassed a preposterously silly amount of gold, like two and a half times the asset value of my, my fund. Um, and the gold went against me. Um, the UK Treasury, in its infinite lack of wisdom, was after a 25 year bear market, uh, decided to, to sell the majority of its holdings, which it had accumulated over the last 300 years. But, you know, at prices below $300, like, yeah, sell it. And I was buying it, but then they kept selling it, and, and it ultimately fell to about 260. And as it was going down, the pain was grotesque. And um, I remember I was in Monaco, I was with a billionaire. Um, I put on my phone, I got like 50 uh, missed messages with my team going, oh, I'm going to go down again, you know. And I took a helicopter, I got back to London, and I was like, sell everything. And they're like, so what did you what did you just say? I'm like, sell it all, sell it all. And I'm like, okay, we sold it all. Uh, and I think three weeks later or something, um, I was never in the office. Um, and I I, I called, I was like, buy it again. And they're like, oh my God, we're doomed. The guy's an idiot. Uh, but you know, um, you've got to be able to, you know, react with circumstances. You've got to survive. Um, you survive by not digging deep graves i can a shallow grave you watch me i, I you, you'll see my hands coming out of the soil i can get myself out of a shallow grave a deep grave i'm gone yeah it's really interesting and then i, I know you know you're quite famous for doing quite well during the great the global recession in 2008 so was that another thing that sort of your contrarian thinking brought you to a position there or yeah contrarian thinking um everyone's talking about inflation and and treasury bonds prices are going higher so everyone's contrarian. Hey, inflation! I was buying the the treasury bond price. I was the contrarian. I was buying the thing going up, and they're all like, "Hey, buy me more and more of the thing going down." Guess who won? Guess who won? I did, you know. But um, but that was um the the yeah. I ended up making I think thirty one point thirty one percent for the year. Um, but in in the month where it all blew up, October of two thousand and eight, um, I made fifty percent. Um, so, you know, like very much the worst month in a hundred years of data. I make 50. It's kind of the parallels, Paul Tudor Jones made 50, 
in October 87. Uh, Paul was a kind of conventional regular genius and he was celebrated and I was kind of like dismissed as a <laughs> raving lunatic. Such are the paths. I, I've got no complaint. Um, but that that ultimate gain says nothing to the trauma um, of having um, held that position for a year. I, I entered the position in May of 2007, so over a year. And it was excruciating. I've never known pain. I've, I've, I've never been tested like it. Um, and literally, I had to wait until you know, three seconds to midnight to, to get my, ultimately to get my return. So it's, it's again, it's hard, it's hard. Uh, you're battling against um, the naivete, the contrarianism of other investors. Yeah, it's this massive loop. So, you know, we mentioned there that lots of volatility, lots of struggle back then, you know, history doesn't repeat itself. It's the classic history doesn't repeat itself, but it's rhymes. So I guess if we look at today, you know, where, how would you compare it to parts in history? Have you thought about that? Is there anything similar or? Sure, 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 sure. Um, so it's all kind of aligned going back again to, uh, to the beginning of the century. You know, the, uh, the NASDAQ crash was kind of an event that um, mathematical models will tell you is a kind of one in 50, 60, 70 year type event, um, as is 2008, as is March uh, 2020, yeah. and, and probably by the end of this year, as is uh, 2022. So uh, owing to the architecture of how um, great sovereign continents and nations are choosing to engage with themselves, and that's typically captured in the language of gold standards in the past, which was the 1920s, and today the, the dollar hegemon. Uh, that system is kind of uh, ripe for change. And I say ripe because what it's doing is, is amplifying weaknesses and it's turning capitalism into this boombox, into this volatility monster, uh, which is creating one in 100 year events every seven years. Okay, so for me, because we haven't re-engineered this kind of sovereign engagement but, but, you know, between continents, um, these periodic uh, flashpoints um, are, are, here to, are here to persist. So I, I, um, I'm as concerned today as I was being, you know, but in May 2007, I was maybe one of 200 people in the world that could, they could kind of sketch on my um, Insta sketch, Instagram, not Instagram, what do you call it? Sketch, uh, etch a sketch on my etch a sketch. I, I could, I could draw out to you um, a, the very plausible, almost inevitable um, demise, i.e., bankruptcy of the the global, uh, the global financial system. Like you know, 12, 15 months uh, later. There's like 200 people who, who could do that. Some of them got celebrated in that, that big movie, The, uh, the, the Big Short. Um, today, um, many, many thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, uh, 50,000 people, whatever, are very aware of, of what's going on. Uh, but it's as, it's, it's, it's as profound and potentially as damaging as what we saw during the great financial uh, crisis we saw. So if we break that down further, why... You know, you mentioned that it's due to this global economy, is how we interact between country, sovereign countries, US dollar hegemony. Why is that having the impact it is? Mm. Um, so I, 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 the, the root cause of it is the relationship between um, uh, China and the United States um, and, and using China as a leap mo mo motive for uh, mercantilism, which is practiced by the Japanese, Singapore, Korea, Germany, um, and, and you know, other nations. But China being a, an inflated $15 trillion economy is, is the poster child and is interrupting the way capitalism and, and, and market kind of equilibrium is meant to work. Uh, China, by this point, was meant to uh, be... Uh, be as prosperous 
as it is today, but with that prosperity, perhaps more um, socially liberal um, and, and less in the thralls of central planners. Um, but it's not partly owing to the, the, um, the, the 2008 uh, crisis. Um, they did not give up on, on those central controls. And so since 2008 with their central planning, uh, they have steadily ensured that the Chinese dollar is undervalued. Um, and, and that um, effectively robs um, Chinese citizens of, 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 of wealth or income in terms of, you know, if, if their currency was 20% higher versus the euro, then to use a silly example, a, a Ferrari, I say a Ferrari because for sure Ferraris are made in Italy. I want to say a German car, but maybe a German car is made in Beijing. I'm not sure, but Ferraris are made in Italy. And, and if the Remimbi were 20, trading 20% higher, then a Ferrari would be 20% less ridiculously expensive. Um, and therefore, those citizens would, would, would have greater uh, consumption power. The Chinese authorities do not wish to afford their citizens um, that liberty because they fear that they'll be idiots and that they'll create a boom and bust cycle. And boom and bust cycles typically do not uh, respect um, tyranny and, um, and, and um, kind of rentist uh, regimes that, that wish to endure forever. So instead they say, we're, you know, we're in control because we want to stay. And so we're going to keep the currency um, low and we're going to waste money on infrastructure. But why did I say waste money? Uh, China repeatedly, um, for about 10 years now, has invested in um, engineering mar marvels, if you will, but NPV projects. So like if they're spending a billion dollars on a, on a multi-span bridge, uh, the problem is the NPV might be uh, 400 million. Um, and that 600 million is never amortized like it, it's, and, and that's why I say GDP is exaggerated. And the, and the colliery of, of that, so um, China doesn't consume as, as much as it should, and therefore um, growth is not endogenous to the Chinese system. They, they, they part treasury bills um, with liberal free societies like the US, and they say, you spend the money, you have the crisis, we're here to endure. And so that process typically, um, boost consumption and it, and it destroys savings in America and if you work all the way through that um, it means that you know marginal the marginal return on capital is kind of is zero if the opportunity cost of capital is kind of zero then prices can can be infinitely high you know Apple became a three trillion dollar stock because um, um, no one wants to take risk I mean that's I mean that, that sounds preposterous that sounds contrarian it sounds preposterous no one what are you talking about stock market has just gone zooming up Bitcoin went to like 65,000 and you tell me no one wants to take risk um, banks don't want to take risk right uh, they are falling over themselves um, actually parking their money in in treasury bills which yield less than what if they lent to the Federal Reserve the Federal Reserve would pay them more but it's risky. They don't do it. And, and they want, if they had to be in equities, they would buy Apple because it's the perceived to be the least commercially risky business in the world. So we reached the point around about the, uh, the end of 2020, the middle of 2021, where riskless businesses, which at the time were, you know, fang-like stocks. I mean, Apple itself, uh, its market capitalization was greater than the German stock market. It was kind of like, the equivalent of the Japanese stock market. You know, that th these are enormous nations. So uh, that's what I mean by people not wanting to take risk. That system needs to be addressed. Uh, what happens is that, you know, people shop at Walmart because they've been displaced, you know, um, either um, they're not earning enough versus uh, the productivity that they offer, or more likely that their, their, uh, their services have been displaced to be manufactured more cheaply in China. And so, um, you are forced to run down your savings. And the only people who, who, who succeed are the 1%. And, you know, if you give another, if you give a thousand bucks to someone that's worth a billion dollars, a billion dollars, they save it. If you give a thousand bucks to someone who's worth 10,000 bucks, you know, they, they, 
you know, um, they consume it. So that's kind of where the world is just now. Yeah. But in that yeah. system, um, that's a system which sends profits or profit share of GDP higher and higher and higher. I think people are aware of that. That's been a, the prevalent trend uh, for the last 25, 30 years, profits gaining more and more uh, a, a, a share of GDP and, and labor does less and less. Right. Um, so it's, um, it's like you're putting the, uh, the unskilled and increasingly it's creeping up this, this, the skilled echelons of, of labor and you're putting them on this crucifix. It's like uh, the only way that continents can adjust vis-a-vis -vis each, each other is for wages to, uh, to fall. And as wages fall, uh, profits go up and then stock markets uh, have this tendency to rise, which then gets amplified by central banks because we live in, a, in an age where debt is four and a half times uh, the size of one year's GDP. Um, and that is tenable because we have all these assets. You know, so in, at the peak in America, uh, public equities plus private equities were about $60 trillion. The tr uh, treasury plus corporate debt market would be another $60 trillion. There's $120 trillion. The residential uh, real estate market, another 35, so $150 trillion. Um, and GDP is... $20 trillion, so seven, seven and a half times GDP is, you know, that big elephant is why you can support debt of, of four, four and a half times GDP. But if, God forbid, the, the asset value falls, then we're all dead. So periodically, um, in March 2009 and, and various events thereafter, central banks have come in and essentially they've underwritten or they have prevented asset prices resetting to zero. Um, and again, that's the amplification, why prices have trended to these extreme highs. Um, and also that's what I said to you at the beginning, that uh, we've created this boom box or volatility box where it's so prone to hiccups where, boom, you know, you don't fall 10%, you might fall 50 or 60%. Yeah. And I guess normally if you look at the past 20 plus years, we'd have, you know, the Greenspan put come in, which is, you know, if the Fed's, market goes down, they freak out, they decrease interest rates, but I'm not confident that's going to happen now just because of the inflation we're seeing driven by, you know, in inflated energy prices, lots of other inefficiencies in the world market. So does that mean that this time could be different or, and especially, you know, you can mention as well, as you mentioned there, how much more debt we have than the past 20 years. Yeah. So will that amplify the issue or? Well, for sure, yeah, for sure, it's, it's amplifying things um, because the inflation, I'm putting inflation in inverted commas, um, is is making people uh, wonder whether that that risk contract with the central bank has has fundamentally changed. Um, you know, it, it, it was like the, the last kind of pertinent example was the end of uh, 2018. The Fed had uh, was doing quantitative tightening, not much like maybe uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 trillion dollars. You know, today they're proposing to do um, a trillion minimum. Um, and they had begun to raise rates and 10-year and rates had, had zoomed up to 3%. Um, and, and the S&P lost 20% of its value. And the Fed came in like, ah, <laughs> we, okay, we're only getting on, we change our mind. And they, they started cutting rates. That That's the this kind of put option vernacular that you you uh, refer to um how can they do this so now the s&p is down 21 percent um, and inflation is accelerating at 8.6 how can they do that is the presumption of the marketplace um i so back to being contrarian i'm I, i'm all over the shop as you can imagine from the way i'm answering the questions um so I kind of feel like I, I still want to buy treasuries. Am I just a broken record? Is that just what I do? I buy treasuries, uh, maybe. So the inflation, inflation, you know, I'm sure you've heard of Milton Friedman and you, and therefore if I say Milton Friedman, you say what, Anthony? You say inflation um, is, inflation is. Well, nothing but a monetary phenomenon. Exactly. Inflation is a monetary phenomenon. Okay. Which is to say, um, as, but so inflation is when every item and service and product that you consume, the price has gone up. Okay. And so uh, for you to maintain your 
previous level of consumption of said items and services, you need more money in your wallet, okay? Which to say, like your salary has to be rising. Uh, you need more money in the system, right? Um, and that money is created not by central banks, but by uh, commercial private banks. And those commercial private banks are terrified. It's again, the reason why Apple was perversely at $3 trillion. They're terrified. It's why they're not invest. They're, they're not doing the overnight uh, repo market with the Fed. They're accepting, you know, way less income return, but for greater security. They're terrified. Okay, um, so they are not printing money. So, I think the higher level of prices that are clearly uh, going on just now will eventually, because there's not that monetary accommodation. So we're creating a corset. And what will happen is we, um, the banks are choosing to destroy demand. And so eventually people just say, well, you know, guess what? Um, I, I'm not subscribing to Netflix. I'm not buying a Peloton. I'm not ordering like five pizzas a night. You know, I'm cutting back on my discretionary because I can't cut back on my non-discretionary. So, I, so we're going to destroy demand. You know, the chairman of the world's largest bank a week ago came out saying, guys, and these guys rarely see this stuff. So this was really uh, notable. Guys, there is a hurricane, hurricane of economic forces building offshore and it's coming. It's the biggest mother recession load that's going to you know, download on us, right? Um, that I think will show that the higher prices just now, which can clearly be associated with you know we we closed the global industrial chain for 18 months and then towards the end of that the, the u.s government sent checks of five trillion dollars to his household saying spend i like so you're like okay china opened early and they're like pushing open the shutters they're like trying to get a light switch to work they're trying to get the dust off the machines and it's like boom like you know we want everything you've got well, you know what? It takes a while to get back up and running. Prices are higher. Same thing happened after the Second World War. Prices, I think CPI was like, you had 20% prints. No one talks about the great uh, post-Second World War inflation because it didn't last. It destroyed demand. So I think that's where we are. But uh, I'm on tenuous ground because I buy things trending higher. The 10-year treasury has been eviscerated. I mean, it has been destroyed. Um, despite that, I think you can say uh, that it's just clinging kind of kind of to some tenuous, very, very long term. It's at the very bottom of a very long term uptrend. And again, finally, I'm going to shut up. But the way I perceive markets with my pop psychology is uh, the Treasury bond market will end. It will die. Yeah, it will be destroyed. Maybe that's today. Um, but when I look back, so when it changed again, the last turning point was in 1982. Um, and it turned from a bear market to a bull market. Um, but in 1982, it, you know, you'd have to be a, a complete idiot. But if you were awake, if, if you actually were conscious, not in a, in a, in a coma, um, you know, for six to nine months, you know, the Fed had raised interest rates, destroyed demand in a recession, and inflation was collapsing. But people were just, you know, like trend and bailing, and 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 the ten year reached, I don't know, 15, 16, 17 percent, despite the bloody obvious uh, destruction of inflation. And so you had to have this blowout. And so for me, if the future is going to be inflationary, maybe it will be. Um, then I would, I would conceive that the treasury bond market will, will actually recover from here, will make a new high. Prices will make a new high because that would be absurd. And again, our system where the masters of the universe are the smartest people in the world, they, their minds cannot deal with that kind of lunatic flight path that we might take. So how could... How could treasuries recover from this point? Well, again, I've told you that the chairman of the uh, of JP Morgan, Jamie Dimon, said, you know, like not a recession, the mother of all recessions. Okay, uh, point. Um, what, what else do we know? We know the Japanese yen 
I can't say it's collapsing, but it's at like 23, 24 year low. It's taking out really, really significant chart points. And as it takes them out, you know, we, we it, it did trade 115, then 125 was crucial. And then it's 135 and then beyond 135, it's 150 and then it's 200. And I'm like, whoa, what? Now that's a Canadian in a gold mine. What that's tell is the more that that trend continues, we are closer and closer to the Chinese uh, devaluing their currency. And again, remember I told you the principal malaise of today's economy is that the Chinese currency is undervalued. And I fear that they're about to go for a 20% devalue, not tomorrow, but in the course of the next 18 months. That's a Mad Max deflation nightmare that would clearly uh, send treasury bond prices back to like yielding 50 basis points. But that's my overly vivid imagination. But that's what I do. I, I, I conceive of narrative, contentious narratives. Yeah, and that's not even mentioning mentioning Europe and the ECB and the struggles that they've been having it having even in it like they haven't in, increased interest rates they haven't started QT but the bond market's already blowing up which is scary to think well but again remember so uh, cl class war has proven to to have been far more powerful than interest rates central banks keep saying we destroyed inflation since the 1980s no you didn't you know we admitted a, a 1.4 billion penniless peasants toiling land in China, which had no fertilizer, who could barely exist and feed themselves. Um, and we, we brought them on chain into the, our global economy. Um, and we displaced 1.4 billion other folk, you know, who, who were previously coal miners in, in the north of England. And, and they made ships in Glasgow, and forgive me for being provincial with regard to the United Kingdom. Um, that was class warfare. And it was, you know, it took the bid away from labor. It made them not price setters. The notion that they've become price setters, the notion that the Bank of England is pursuing, hey, we've got to raise rates to stop people demanding more. What planet are those bozos on? You've got no pricing power if you work in an Amazon filing, you know, a, a shipping factory. You've got no pricing power, you know, nonsense. So, um, what I haven't said, and we have to say, is that since the great financial crisis, we've been in a depression. A depression is, yes, the economy has recovered, but it has not recovered to the flight path, to the profile. If we were having this conversation in uh, June of two, the year 2000, we could make a pretty reasonable stab at where we thought global GDP would be today. Today, that figure is about $100 trillion, but a rational money market person uh, back then would have, would have estimated it would be at 125 trillion. The failure to hit that trend profile means we're in a depression. Why are we in a depression? Because idiotic central banks keep tightening policy because they don't understand that this is all about class warfare and not interest rate policy. Yeah, well, so that's pretty fascinating. And I guess, you know, as you mentioned there, it's been so beneficial. The last 40 years has been very beneficial for deflation you know there's lots of wealth generation you could say baby boomers have come into the market to you know increase the potential workers across the world do you see the changing you know sorry globalization as well from what i was mentioning before do you see the potential for that to reverse now that we're seeing deglobalization you know you could say transition to renewable energies um you know poor demographics a lot more older people retiring and not actually working do you think we could almost see a transition from that to higher inflation in the coming years or but i guess that would be offset by china decreasing their currency yeah, so again it's like we have been pursuing class warfare uh, since the end of the 1970s and that class for warfare has resulted in higher and higher profit share as a share of gdp and therefore higher and higher stock market values and, and, and other risk assets um, and that's great you said wealth, there's been some, there's been wealth creation, but there's been a heck of a lot of fictitious wealth creation. And that's great if, if you're a stockholder, if you're part of the enfranchised guy. But as each year passes, like your generation, right? What assets have you got? Right? And how do you get into and this is this is the trouble with Bitcoin because you know, Bitcoin is this 50 vol, this thing that moves a lot and goes up a lot, and comes down a lot, but has force, it has energy. 
Uh, it has the the ability to titillate. You know, like if you're young, you're in a hurry. Like you can't afford anything. It's like you can't afford an apartment, yeah, you know, in, in a major metropole. Um, so you're like, you know, I'm, and I say to you, hey, like put it in the stock market, and the stock market might go up five, six, seven percent a year. Like, no, no, give me something else. Like, what about Bitcoin? It goes up three hundred percent. You know, went from ten thousand in the summer of twenty twenty to uh, March twenty one. It went from like ten thousand to sixty thousand. Boom! Give me some of that. Right. That's Jesus, that's so destructive. Um, so, but anyway, to your point, the class warfare is there, right? We, we know his profile. The class warfare is globalization. It is another word for it. Uh, but now central banks are, are um, it creating even more peril because they're, they're on top of class warfare. They're putting interest rates. They're raising, you've got credit cards. You've got, you might have a mortgage, but you've got student loans and they're raising the price, right? And it's like the system, the, the political economy is going to burst. It's like, you bozos cannot solve it. Like, this is, this is the, this is, um, you know, this is where, this is the end of the 17th, I always get these centuries wrong, 17th century, this is the French Revolution. We're going to, we're sharpening up guillotines and we're going to start chopping off heads. We, we've had enough class warfare, right? Okay, like at least 1.4 billion Chinese people kind of benefited. But when you start raising interest rates on top of that, we're going to seek redress, okay? So, um, I there's a mean there. There are solutions. All the the, the supposed smart suit people that you're meant to read, they're clueless. You want to understand the world. You want you want a chance of succeeding. I I, I do I do this deliberately. I dare you to take my advice. I dare you to listen to me. It's the crazy mother people that actually have got a chance of seeing. Uh, the solutions and the solution today is we have to stop the class warfare. Uh, we have to demand that China actually grows up, um, has a democracy, um, that it trusts its domestic citizens uh, to consume their legitimate right, um, and it has to stop parking surplus savings into the economies of Australia, the United States, uh, Europe, the UK. Um, and to facilitate that, we should starting with the US tre Treasury, should start imposing um, a withholding tax on sovereign holdings of Treasury uh, bonds and bills uh, charged yearly. Um, and the mercantilists, namely China, will pay it because they will do anything but actually pivot uh, to democracy. But at least they will start charging them uh, for the class warfare that they've imposed on our citizens. And from that, like you could, the US alone could create about between 100 and 300 billion dollars a year in carry from that, that tax. And from that, you could actually create a sovereign wealth fund, which would not be for everyone, but it would be for the disenfranchised, for like you and your mates, and, and you know, um, and saying, you know what, you're not in this system. Um, and we will, like at some point, the feds will reverse their policy and they will cut interest rates and stock markets will go zooming up again. Like when we get to that point with this sovereign wealth fund, we're going to buy stocks and whatever, and it's going to be in your name. I mean, we can solve this. If we don't solve it with crazy people like me, then there are crazy people with guillotines. And, and if you think I'm bad, they're really bad. Yeah. And do you think we've seen that with Russia, I guess, and how they've sort of obviously it's due to a conflict, but they've basically taken their reserves and they're talking about you know, either spending it or putting it aside. Do you think we've already maybe seen that? Seeing what? Uh, what is what is the? So you're talking about the confiscation of the uh, the Russian foreign exchange reserves? Yeah, exactly. And then that way, and they're not sure what they want to do with it, but they're thinking of sort of, I guess, doing what you're saying in terms of. I'm not sure if they do a sovereign fund, but spending it somewhere basically. Well, they're talking about maybe spending like that's you know seizing a you know, a super yacht and a, and a property here and there. I mean, it's kind of, they're not really talking about touching those those reserves, but the, the confiscation of the uh, Russian reserves get to my mind, gets um, too much headline because, you know, those bozos have got nuclear bombs. And so you can't really go to war with them. Um, and therefore you have to kind of, you have to define uh, what, what a conflict 
um, is going to be. And so a wise person would create a conflict which would be commercial. Right? You know, and you just say, like, your behavior is so abhorrent um, that we're going to exclude you from, you know, from, from our system until you get it. You know, and it's like, is that, what moral judgment do you want to make about that? I mean, they are clearly lacking morality. Our system has morality. And again, there's a price. Like, again, Chinese, stop downloading and, and, and like creating class warfare in America. If you're going to do it, we're going to charge you. Russia, stop flagrantly. Like, you know, like they're, they're bombing folk. They're killing folk, right? They just happen to be in the wrong geography, right? And that's just abhorrent. We can't nuke them because they would nuke us. So like, okay, take their reserves and do everything economically to dissuade them. That makes a lot of sense to me. What's the problem? Send, send me a, a, a Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that's interesting. And I guess the only, I, their concern might be that, not, but probably not Russia, but if they did that to China or if they, you know, the carry trade, I guess, all that investment that they put into the country would come out of there and then the markets would crash. You know, in Australia, you mentioned that, you know, the property market, lots of Chinese capital, same with, I guess, Canada, US, UK. Yeah. So I guess, is that, do you think that would be the concern that they basically, most yeah. of the markets would- Profound, crash? profound concern. Again, this is why I'm more scared than almost I've ever been because, um, because yeah, major economic sovereign um, actors are behaving irrationally. You know, no one saw Russia going into Ukraine, why? It doesn't make any damn sense, it's stupid stupid it's irrational right and kind of the thing that keeps us all together the glue is we might want to do stupid things but we don't right you know you go to half and you know you call people names okay they did it all right so we've kind of gone into this irrational world and so you think well what other irrational things could happen and you know and let, let me kind of end by being a complete moron but um the risk of you know china wants to uh, reunify taiwan stated intention um spending a huge amount of money uh, on their navy and, and all that capacity um the you cannot fight an economic war with china you know right, russia is like one and a half percent of global gdp you know it is boom you know china we, we, we spent 30 years into they are we are them they are us we cannot you can't have sanctions um no we've kind of worked out that these guys were supposed to be Democrats by now, but actually they're jackboots and they're marching over people and like, you know, they've no respect for our life. And we're like, holy Moses, we're so vulnerable to these mother idiots, right? You know? Um, and so give us 15 years and we will have disentangled, we'll, we'll push back on the globalization and maybe that's inflation, but we'll, we'll have kind of given ourselves some space whereby in 15 years time, if they were to be foolish and try and take, take out Taiwan, we go, right, okay, confiscated. And we're not trading with you. You're out of the club. That's 15 years time at the earliest. Today, China is never more powerful. Like, China, why doesn't China do it now before September? Why not? What is, what's going to stop them? What does Uncle Joe Biden do? What does he do? Not nothing. That's what terrifies me. That absolutely terrifies me. Um, and I, and 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 I, and so and again, let's let's keep keep rhyming with that. So Russia's been kept afloat by the immorality of the Indians and and others uh, taking their oil. They're like, "Why well, is a good deal? Like we're screwing them, you know? You know we need the oil, you know? Like we're poor, we need the oil. Like really." You know, these are evil, like you, you're investing and sponsoring global evilness, right? But okay, right? So they're getting oil 30% cheaper, okay? So again, if China, God forbid, does that Taiwan thing, they'll devalue the currency 25%. And like India will keep, there'll be, the US will say, don't touch them. India will be like, you know, hit me, hit me, hit me, you know, because I can buy your, your stuff was cheap. Now I can buy it 25% even cheaper. So like, I've got China going into Taiwan. <laughs> I've got China devaluing. Uh, the s and is down 20%. And people are like, oh, we're going to get a rally. Really? Maybe. Sure. Of course. Like, but this is a point where do you really want to really buy Bitcoin here? Do you want to buy anything here? 
I mean, you know, I'm, I'm speaking to you just now at my, 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 my London home, but I, I live on a tiny island in the middle of nowhere. I've got a bunk. I, this is true. I live in St. Bars, middle of nowhere, guys. I'm going back, all right? You, you guys have got to deal with this stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm going back to, you know, to my bunker. Yeah, well, I think that's such a vital lesson for people to, to take away from this all. And, you know, there's so many asymmetrical risks to the downside. As you said there, if you buy a... In, might go up but there's a lot more chance that you know these assets are potentially going to go down at least in the short term well there's there's, there's a probability of anything happening you know yeah. um the the really concerning thing is the probability of all that nutty strange stuff that irrational stuff that stuff that's never going to happen the problem is the probability that a rational person um would um would apportion to those events is going up and up and up yeah and, and that will change asset allocation and that will change investment behavior in, in, and not in a manner that will push asset prices higher. In fact, the reverse. Yeah, wow. It's a very important message. So I've been trying to, because I think the past few podcasts I've been doing have been quite negative because there are lots of concerns. Is there anything that you are positive about, I guess, going into the future in terms of markets or anything else? <laughs> I know it's a tough question at the moment. Joy is our joy is our energy. Um, <laughs> the and oh god, we, um, I, I I am profoundly bullish on on us. Like we're idiots, but in the long term, like you smooth out the the idiot stuff and innovation and like good people and heroes and and all of that stuff. Um, but in in terms of markets, we talk about you know we you were trying to do masterclass and like how you get better, how you, how you master. Uh, in investing, looking after your own like uh, early stage wealth portfolio and, and move forward in life and have observations. Um, and you'll get much advice. But um, the thing that's seldom relayed in, in conversations like this is that there are times when the best thing is to disengage, to say, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't need anything. I really don't need anything uh, at this point. Um, and that's, that's also the hardest thing. Some, some of the, the greatest um, um, hedge fund traders ever to, to live they could do it just you know i'm not saying i, I certainly wasn't one of them but if you remember if you go back to um 2000 march 2003 and I, I say to my desk sell everything and i buy it back i had three weeks i rested i i bought shares in a sausage condom manufacturer um you know which was another story and i just I, I lit up another part of my mind um um but you know, people like Stan Druckenmiller and, and, and they're like, you know, Stan's had a great run recently. Uh, he's out there on the tapes. There's a great interview, recent interview at the SON, S-O-H-N conference. You should download that. Um, and this is one of those points where he's disengaged. It's like, it's, it's, yeah, I've made, I've made some money, but where we are, you know, I was short bonds, but now, you know, like bond, they've had such a huge move down. Uh, I was short equities, but you know, these crazy things could rally. Um, the dollar, he's a bear on the dollar. I think he's wrong about that. But he's like, dollar's going up. I ain't shorting that. So what is he doing? Doing nothing. He's like, I'm, I'm waiting. Opportunities will come again. So disengagement is actually, no one, no one proffers that as advice, uh, named, largely because no one can, no one can do it. Um, but that's what, that's what I would offer. Yeah, I think that's a great message to take away. And I was, I was told by someone that, you know, you, you don't just long or short, you can, do nothing as well. And that's a position to take. I would say never short from experience. Shorting is, in, is an irrational, it's, it's noble, it's truth discovery. And I love the fact that we have agents in our economy that attempt the most impossible thing. But in terms of a personal decision, I would always uh, advise uh, anyone that I met not to short. Um, just, just don't get involved. Like if it's overvalued, then it'll fall. You know, like but just pick to like make sure you sell them before, once they start going down. Like and just walk away, um, and and try and find things that are going up. Yeah, definitely. So many great points. So Hugh, thanks so much for for your time today. And I guess, um, what would be one message? You know, we've talked about so many different aspects, <laughs> so many different things. You know, advice, economy, all this stuff. Is there one message you'd like people to take away from our chat? Of course there is. We're at a point just now where, so the, the what is the system? It's a hedge fund manager um, or it's 
um, your unit trust, your mutual fund manager, it's your financial advisor. It's, it's some bozo in a suit, right? And let me tell you that what, how, what their motto is. T heads, I win. Tails, I win. You, you lose, <laughs> okay? Break, like, break, break the cycle, right? Listen to crazy people every now and again. Yeah, definitely. At least, at least listen. I think that's the most important thing. You can uh, <laughs> make your decision up after that. But exactly. Hugh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, we mentioned there that you're, you've mentioned you're on Twitter. You've got the uh, podcast as well. Is there anywhere else people can find your work? Yeah. I mean, please, people, if you want to, if, you, if you're insane and you want more, uh, <laughs> YouTube, it's Hugh Hendry Official. Uh, Instagram, you'll see me in my bikini. Uh, it's Hugh Hendry official, but on the YouTube we do uh, we do the Asset Capitalist Show. Uh, we release every Friday. Um, there's also an audio tape which is which is out there again um, using my name. You'll find it, and on Twitter um, I, I try and update that on a daily basis. Hugh, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to the book. We'll have to talk again when it's released. I'm sure there's some amazing stories in there. But yeah, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.